Aaron, if you could start. Oh, we are. Thank you. So welcome everyone. Today is June 23rd, 2021. This is the Amherst Conservation Commission meeting. And so we'll start off with a couple of comments for me. One is just let folks know that we did have a couple of interviews a week or two ago for replacement folks for the commission. Um, as we were just saying, I will be stepping down in about a month. I should be stepping down now. I'm just staying on to get through a couple more hearings and then I'll be stepping down. Um, I think that the, um, the interviews went well. And so uh, I think that we'll have, um, we have strong candidates. The process works that the people who are part of the interview process, so that was myself and Aaron, um, the town manager, and then a woman from another committee who I can't remember who just works to um, help facilitate um, town committees uh, was there as well. But after we make our recommendation, which we did, then eventually it does go to town council. And so they would be the ones who officially make it. Uh, as we were just saying, um, it sounds like Larry is most likely going to be able to stay on if he so chooses. Um, and so we just have to wait on a final word on that and then we can move forward. Um, but given that we are, that I will be, I will certainly be stepping down. One thing that I mentioned last time is I thought it'd probably behoove us to have a vote tonight on who will be taking over leadership of our commission. Um, so we need a chair and we need a co-chair. So uh, looking for nominations for those positions. I nominate Jen Fair for chair of the Conservation Commission. Second. How do you feel about that, Jen? <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, I feel like it is a job I can do. I um, don't have any more time, like more bandwidth um, to give to this. So um, in the thought of a co-chair, it might be good to have someone who does have the bandwidth to be available for site visits um, and like more of the field work outside of meeting times. Um, Cause that's like my main weakness is that we really can't, usually can't shake free um, to attend that sort of thing. So I am willing and able to run the meetings and be the chair, but I'm going to need help for a field presence. And if, if the fact that I can't be available for a field presence is a reason to have somebody else do the job, then that is completely understandable. <laughs> I'm, I'm totally happy with that. <laughs> yeah. And we've had that in the past. So the chair before me, so Briny, I don't think she was ever at a field visit. No. Yeah. So, um, so there is some precedent for that, but um, definitely I think the idea of making sure we have some minimum level of coverage for our site visits is good. Um, we're definitely not, that's not one of our strengths right now. Um, we had one site visit this week and me and the person, we had a nice visit, but it was just the two of us. So, which isn't too uncommon, but as long as there's one person there, I think we're good. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I and I feel like that you do a lot of that and I just can't. So I'm lucky that I have the flexibility and my children are old enough. So it makes a big difference. Aaron, I mean, I, I think, well, it, or Brett, I think the question for me is without some other folks here, can we kind of ha delay half of this decision for a co-chair or vice chair or so no? The, the only other person is really, oh no, I guess we have Fletcher and Laura. So yeah. yeah. So that's right. So I was thinking, yeah, sorry. Well, I'm going to apologize to Laura who's not here anyways, but um, Fletcher, he probably would not um, be a co-chair is my guess because he's going to be phasing off pretty soon, but Laura would be an option there as well. So. Does anyone have a strong desire to co-chair amongst the group here? Or co-chair, you can also think of it as a um, chair elect, so to speak, as well. So, mm -hmm. I can't say that I have a strong desire or even necessarily a strong skill set, but I do have a lot of flexibility for a skill, uh, for a site visit. So uh, with Jenna's chair, if you want to give me more direction when you can't see a site as to what you're looking for. I'm happy to go out there and yeah, look forward Good. to that. Good. 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 Good.
So again, the title's weird. I wouldn't want co-chair or anything like that, but I'm certainly helping with the sites. <laughs> yeah, and it's not even that I know what I'm looking for. It's like more being that you get a feel for it and you see things that you wouldn't know to look for. I think like that's the thing. And the value of the site visit is what's not on the plans. So far, yeah. Yeah. And I've been on site visits with you, Leroy, and, and you've seen you're you're solid. Like you know what you're looking at. And like, yeah, you're you're good. Appreciate it. Uh, can we, I mean, can we make, can I make two nominations? Can we do that? Mm -hmm. Are we feeling vice chair or co-chair? Where are we at? Advice at best. <laughs> are, folks, are folks comfortable? I think with I'm vice chair, technically. Currently. Yeah, I was going to say yeah. currently, but yeah. Okay, so I nominate Leroy for vice chair. Second. Okay, excellent. So we have two nominations that are on the table. I guess we'll take them in order. So um, the first one is for Jen to become chair after I step down, which again, probably August-ish, um, but, and so all in favor. So we'll go around uh, voice vote. So Anna. Aye. Larry. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Jen. Aye. <laughs> and I as well. So congratulations. Yeah. Jen. Go Jen. Go Jen. Okay. So, team effort. Team effort. None of you are being let off, let off the hook here. Oh, I am. <laughs> oh, Brett. We're calling yeah. what you think. <laughs> Emeritus. Emeritus. <laughs> oh, um, okay. So a vote for vice chair for Leroy. So Anna. Aye. Larry. Aye. Jen. Aye. And Leroy. All right. And yeah. I as well. So thank you, Leroy. So yeah, it'll go swimmingly. And so fantastic. So thank you both. Um, yeah, I'll be off the, the commission. If there's questions for me, obviously, you know, just kind of let me know. But obviously, you also be in great hands with Aaron. So okay, so um, that was a little bit longer than I usually have from my side, but that is it at that at this point. So Aaron, do you want to move us along? Yes, let me just see. We have our first at 7.30. Um, yeah, so let's go right to minutes. I don't know if everyone had a chance to read the minutes. I sent them out last minute. Yeah, I did. I did as well. I did not, but I'm a, I'm a fast read. I'm sorry, I was away from my computer for a while. I'll go really fast. Yeah. How dare you leave your computer? It, it, I was behind yeah. today. So, so rude of me. <laughs> All right. I'll make a motion that we approve the minutes of 6921. Thank you, Larry. Looking for a second. Second. Thank you, Leroy. Okay, so voice vote, Jen. Aye. Leroy? Aye. Larry? Aye. Anna? Aye. And I for me as well. Minutes pass. Great. And I'm just going to jump to the end of my PowerPoint. We'll kind of go in reverse order here. Um, UMass contacted me that they're going to be doing a, um, a, a treatment for the eutroph eutrophication um, that's going on in the UMass pond. So that's just an FYI, they have a permit for that. Um, 300 North Pleasant Street is a residential property. Um, and I was basically asked to advise what type of permit um, they should file for it. And due to the proximity of the work to the resource area, I recommended that they file a notice of intent application. Um, however, um, they are doing a significant amount of impervious surface removal. They're taking out a part of a parking lot. Um, there's currently an outfall in the wetland and they're pulling it back pretty significantly um, away from the wetland. And so you can see, um, and the outfalls being pulled away from the wetland as well. But they're still within 20 feet of the wetland and they're doing work right up against um, the wetland line here to 
pull the impervious surface out. So Bucky Sparkle asked for a read from the commission if you guys would accept an RDA for it or if you would in fact want a notice of intent. Um, it's converting a previously commercial site to a residential site. So basically they're taking this property and they're turning it into a, a home as opposed to a, um, a commercial uh, business. Is that the so, old silver scape? No, that... this is where the kennel was. Oh, okay, gotcha. A little bit up the street from. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Um, I I sort of still lean toward notice of intent application, usually due to proximity. Like, if something, my general um, rule that I follow is, if something's closer than fifty feet, I usually require notice of intent. If it's further than fifty feet away, I would say an RDA is okay. And then there are some instances, like if it was a tree remo tree removals or if it was something that was a little less impactful, I might suggest an RDA, but um, anyways, it's entirely up to you guys what you think is appropriate, but he asked for your opinion on what you, if, if an RDA would be acceptable for this project. Um, from my perspective, it does seem like an NOI would be yeah, more appropriate. I don't think that the workload is going to be hugely different on his side. It'll, it's definitely going to have some impact in the wetland. Um, granted, most of it's going to be positive. I agree with that. Um, but it'll also just give us a little bit more control, um, you know, once we move through everything. Yeah, I agree. That I agree with that. I agree. My general feel. Um, Sorry, no, 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 no. I mean, I was not adding anything new. I was just going to say like, yeah, within a hundred feet or within, you said it's within 50, right? Mm -hmm. Like that, that, yeah. Okay. So it sounds like general consensus to file an NOI. Okay. Yep. All righty. Um, so we are tabling the discussion on the 61A for right now um, because that the review from town council came in after the agenda was posted um, and we didn't actually have it listed on the agenda and we wanted to make sure that we gave um, a butters an op or you know people who who in the community who want to have an opinion on that to attend um, that it be, be posted. Um, this week, um, yesterday, actually, I was contacted by James Hurl, who um, is a, a ag producer out off of Southeast Street, and um, the, the backside of his field was being flooded um, as a result of a beaver dam um, that goes, there's a, the, the stream that flows underneath um, the bike path, and the Beaver Dam was on his property. He met this morning out there with um, a representative from DCR and, and they were in agreement that, that the dam was in fact on his property. Um, there is a provision under the Wetlands Protection Act for emergencies for ag producers if their farm fields are being flooded that they are allowed to uh, to breach the dam if it's being filled or if it's being flooded. and. Um, so I basically gave him the go ahead to um, incrementally draw it down so that his field was no longer flooded, but told him that he had to report back to us within three days with photos and basically just letting us know that it was done. Um, and there, and I did talk to DEP, there's no emergency certification required for that because it's an exemption under the agricultural provision. Yeah, and so this is a long-standing issue, Aaron, and mm -hmm. Jim Hurl, he hasn't been in front of us for a while, but for a while he was here on a regular basis. Okay. Um, and we've even had this specific issue before us before about those beavers on the backside because they're just coming across the, the rail trail. Mm -hmm. um, this is not going to stop them. They're going to keep on coming. Um, right. Did he mention at all about how significant the flooding was? And was? He doesn't want the beavers there. He's been trying to get rid of them for a while. Um, so I just don't want to see it used as an excuse for doing, yeah. And a similar question. I'm just wondering if the land's currently under production or fallow or what's going on. It's a hay field. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's, that's the crop that's grown there. Um, 
so I, I was not able to get out there yesterday to look at it or today, unfortunately, but um, I could go out tomorrow and take a look at it. Um, so I'm not sure and I haven't seen photos yet, but I, I do know that DCR went out and looked at it and they agreed that it was in fact, a, you know, an issue that they didn't have a problem with him breaching it. Of course, it was on his property. So um, it's kind of, uh, if, if he feels that it's that it's damaging his field, then he has the right under state law to, to remove it as long as he notifies us. Um, so. Yeah, so it would definitely be good to just kind of double check to make sure that it is actually, um, you know, having a substantial impact on land, in my opinion. Okay. Okay. I will definitely <clears throat> go out and take a look at it. Um, okay. And, yeah. And he might want to think about long, <clears throat> excuse me, long-term solutions. Um, breaching that dam is not going to do much. Is okay. he also actively trapping? I mean, he usually is. I don't, I don't think he can trap now, but usually during open trapping season, he is actively trapping there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know he has in the past. Yeah, and it's kind of weird. I think that he actually owns property on both sides of the rail trail. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a kind of funny property that's there. But yeah, so uh, east side of the, of the rail trail, that's not ag land, obviously. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I did... Um he mentioned to me about it, he he cited a law about trapping them and i did note to him that it is not beaver season right now so you know removal of the beavers would require a permit from the board of health um but he didn't indicate any desire to remove the beavers just that he wanted to breach the dam so that the water was released a little bit um but you know if it's open season they you know and you have a, a hunting permit he could he could trap them um, mm -hmm. if, if he wanted to but uh, I I mean I'm certainly happy to you know follow up with him and let him know that I informed you guys of the situation and what your concerns were and um, just follow up with him and maybe have a conversation and you know see what his you know long term if there's a you know a long term management plan for addressing the situation. So it's it's tricky. I mean, it's tricky even on conservation land. We've had this issue like the beavers, even if even if you remove the beavers, beavers, they'll come right back. And there are situations where beaver deceivers or um, gates around culverts and things just are not effective um, or not appropriate for a given site. So um, in some cases, there's not a whole lot that you can do, but well, I'll follow up with him and see if there's anything. I'll take a look at it and see if I, you know I have any ideas or if he has any ideas for long term, something he wants to do. Yeah, I mean, last time we did, um, DCR was involved. Uh, I can't remember who the wildlife specialists were, but they were definitely involved, and that's when the some of I think additional beaver deceivers were installed over on the east side. I don't, I can't recall if that's on his property or exactly whose it is. It has been tried and well, they're still there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, but it's, yeah, once they come into his property kind of under that bridge, I think that's where the mm -hmm. issue probably is. Okay. Yeah. Um, so there was, there's a couple emergency certifications. Um, one of them was for 20 ball lane um, in Amherst. There's, it's the um, old Matusco repair facility. Um, it's a potential 21E site. Um, and they got a demolition permit from um, the historic commission and from the building inspector. And um, they basically had it deemed um, unsafe. The building itself was deemed unsafe and had to be demolished. So um, I got the order to issue an emergency certification from Dave, which I did. Um, and basically they're, they're only allowed per the emergency certification to remove the structure itself. They have to leave the slabs in place and they can't do any ground disturbance as part of the, um, the emergency certification. It's just to demo the structure itself. So I just would need a vote to ratify that emergency certification. 
Okay. Sounds like, yeah, I'm not sure that we really have much say in this for, there, I don't think there's much that we can do in this, so. So moved. Second. Wait, what are we move? Sorry. Emergency I thought I was, cert. yeah. All right, second. Uh, yep, so this is the emergency cert for a 20 ball lane. Yeah. Larry, you're throwing me with these so moves. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in too many committees, <laughs> particularly when they're recorded. <laughs> okay, so voice vote, Anna. Aye. Larry. Aye. Jen. Aye. Leroy. Aye. And I as well, so that passes. Okay, great. And then the other one is just more of an FYI. I haven't gone out to look at this one, but I'll go take a look at it tomorrow. This just came in late this afternoon. Um, I've been in touch with the gentleman who owns the property. There are um, several hazard trees. Um, it's kind of a, from what I understand, sort of like a hedgerow that, with a bunch of dead trees. And then within the the dead trees, there's a couple dying trees. And so they want to take them down because they're leaning up against the house or they're leaning towards the house. So I'll go take a look at them, but expect to see that on the next agenda. And then in the packets, there was a follow-up um, monitoring report on 99 Pulpit Hill Road, which was an enforcement case. Um, I don't know if anyone had a chance to look at it. I can certainly pull it up. Um, what I took away from the report was that there was a couple follow-up items, basically, that their um, inspector is suggesting that they complete on the site. And so I would just like to respond to the landowner and say we would appreciate if you could follow your um, consultant's recommendations on um, addressing these remaining issues in the restoration area. Yeah, I read through it and those recommendations seem to make sense to me. Um, seems like they did most of it. They tried a couple things, just need a little more work and they should be in good shape. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, did anybody else have any sort of questions or issues with that one or? Let me just, um, as long as we have a few minutes, I just want to take a quick, oh, um, we got a couple monitoring reports. Um, just as an FYI, um, <clears throat> there's the Aspen Heights project, which is out on Northampton Road. Um, there have been a couple issues with the um, level spreaders, which are the outlet devices for the stormwater structures. Um, basically, they've been holding, they've been, they're, they're designed to infiltrate water um, and do sort of like a sheet flow situation to allow infiltration um, into the ground. And what's happening is water's just sitting there. And at the outlets, um, they are causing the vegetation to die. And so I've been working with the Hadley Concom to try to come up with a solution. They're trying a couple um, different options for reseeding it, possibly putting down turf to stabilize it. We're not at a decision point just yet, but we've been looking at that. But that's really the um, sort of the crux of that as well. On the east side of the property, I authorized them. To, um, this is the, the part that's up against green leaves. I authorize them to remove the erosion controls there because it's it's the work has been completed on that side and everything was fully stable and they're starting their planting plan. They're putting in a bunch of trees along that edge. So just so that the board's aware of that. Aaron, with um, the level spreader, is any of the issue had to do with a high uh, water table there? I think there's multiple issues going on, but that's definitely one of them. Um, the other issue is it's actually not even on the Amherst side, it's on the Hadley side, but it is relevant to the Amherst permit because um, that level spreader actually handles stormwater that comes off of systems that are in Amherst. So it's relevant to me and I definitely have looked at it and offered my suggestions. Um, right now, I think one of the big issues or questions really is that there's after the outlet to the level spreader, there's um, a uh, 
the um, erosion control sock. And so it's acting as a dam basically to water that's coming out of the level spreader. And the, cons <clears throat> the concern is that water's damming up behind that erosion control, but we don't wanna authorize removal of the erosion control because the area is not stable. Mm -hmm. um, there's no vegetation established. So it's like, it's a catch 22. Um, and so my suggestion was, why don't they lay down turf there and take the erosion control sock out and see if it's functioning normally. Um, they had come up with at least one other idea, which was um, some planting or some seed seeding that would have been appropriate to put inside a detention basin. So, you know, basically a seed mix that's designed to, to do well in wetter conditions. So they might be doing that, but um, we're, we're in kind of a back and forth discussion of how to solve the problem. Okay. And in, term, in terms of the monitoring reports, we're almost at 7.30. No, but I'll just, before we jump into hearings, one sort of caution I have, I guess, um, for the meeting tonight is that we already have five hearings booked for the meeting on um, July 14th. And Three of them are new hearings. Two of them are continuations that were never really heard to start with. So it's going to be the next meeting um, on the 14th is going to be a really intense meeting with five new hearings that are just basically we're just taking testimony on. So anything that opens or anything that is being continued tonight, I would really recommend that we put on the July 28th agenda because otherwise we're going to be there really late into the evening on the, the 14th. Um, but I am concerned, particularly with Tofino, because of where we are with quorum issues. And, you know, Brett, you're only, I guess, going to be staying on to the beginning of August potentially. And um, that just doesn't give us much time to resolve it before you leave the, the board. So just kind of a word of caution. I'm not sure how exactly we're gonna sort that out or if we can resolve everything tonight or at the next meeting, but some action is going to need to be taken by the end of July, I think. Okay. Yeah, and at least two of the hearings tonight are being continued. So we have those as well. Yeah, and on those, um, well, <clears throat> one may or may not be continued depending on you guys' opinion, um, but one of them will definitely be a continuation. Okay. So. Well, when is the next meeting? So just to let you guys know, the next meeting is going to be July 14th. There was a note in the PowerPoint presentation about the 7th, and the reason for that was because two of the hearings got continued to July 7th. But I talked to Dave this uh, this afternoon, and I'm going to actually come on to Zoom on July 7th, and if anybody happens to come on for those two hearings, I will let them know that the hearings are continued to the 14th, um, because it was an error, and that's not our usual meeting night, and also, um, it's just, it, I didn't want to mess everybody's schedule up, and Dave's not going to be here, so it just worked better that way. Okay. Thank you, Erin. And so I have just after 7.30 on my clock. So that means that we can get um, our first hearing on of the night uh, rolling here. And so this is a continuation and this is a notice of intent for Tofino Prop from Tofino Associates. This is for Concord Way, lots number one, two, five, six, seven, and eight. And so I see that Ted Parker is here and oops, I do not have the ability to elevate people to panelists, Aaron. All right. I just promoted Ted to panelist. Excellent. And I don't know, I see, I know, I think Blake is a, an abutter, but I'm not sure if Jim is affiliated with um, the project in terms of presenting. So if he is, you can raise your hand and I'll promote you, but. Okay, and I don't see, 
I see that you promoted Ted, but I don't see him on the screen, which is kind of odd. So um, Ted, you should be able to, uh, yep, you can at least unmute yourself. Um, okay. And so why don't we start off with you, Ted, if you wouldn't mind reintroducing yourself and give us, giving us an update on where we're at from your side of things. And then I will hand it over to Erin for an update from her side. Great. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Ted Parker. I'm here representing Tofino Associates in these six notices of intent that have was submitted some time ago and have been, uh, you know, continued a number of times due to some uh, uncertainty about the boundary of the vernal pool that's uh, the center of the of the discussion. Um, and. Uh, I guess at the last meeting, which I apologize for not attending, I thought I had uh, I had let uh, folks know that I wasn't going to be able to attend, but apparently that didn't make it all the way through. The message didn't make it all the way through. Um, incorporating um, Art Allen's information, the, the 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 field visit that Art Allen made, I was there with him when he made that, and the discussion of how exactly to define the boundary of a vernal pool. Um, I, my submittal tonight uh, includes a, uh, a, a, a disagreement with Art about how he defined the boundary of the vernal pool. Um, I've done a deep dive into the, <laughs> into both 310 CMR and into the Amherst Weapons uh, Regulations. And I, I believe that there's a bit of a conflation of two terms going on that uh, may have contributed to the, um, to, to the misunderstanding. And um, I think it might be worth discussing that um, while we discuss lots seven and eight, I think lot five is pretty, even if I were to stipulate that art was correct, lot five would still be, all the work would still be well out of uh, any buffer zone around a vernal pool um, regardless of how it's uh, defined. Um, and lot six, we did our best to keep everything out of, um, out of the buffer, all the work out of the buffer of the vernal pool. So I don't know how you all want to proceed um, if you want to discuss the, like take the low hanging fruit and deal with that. Um, or if we want to get into the meat of discussing uh, the issues about the boundary of the vernal pool. Okay, thank you, Ted. Um, so I'll turn it over to Aaron in just a sec. And yeah, I just wanna reiterate one thing that Ted was saying that even though we kind of talk about all of these as one large um, hearing, they are separate. And so there's really no issues with us separating those. And that's definitely something that crossed my mind as well. Granted, if we separate them, we'd probably be just saving the harder ones for later, but it's definitely something um, worth considering if we go in that direction. So, Erin? Um, so, I mean, I've, I've corresponded with you folks via email um, on some of these issues, and I, I am in agreement that if there are... Um, notices of intent that we can move through and get off of the board's plate, then um, I am in favor of that. Um, from where I stand, you know, we've been, we've been dealing with this, uh, with these notices of intent for some time. And, and my goal is to help us to achieve closure um, as soon as possible on them. Um, I think from the beginning, there have been a lot of questions um, from from abutters and from the board, and also just the age of the order of conditions. It's a it's a very old permit. I think it was issued in two thousand four originally, um, the subdivision permit. And so, the review by Art, I think, was to give us a little bit of professional. Um, input on what the status of the vernal pool was and the boundaries of the vernal pool so that the board could be better informed to render a decision on the outstanding lots. And um, 
the fact that that our third party consultant is you know their findings are being disputed really creates a complicated situation for us because I think that and that's really the, the main question that I think the commission needs to make a decision on how to proceed with so for for example does the board want to duke it out in terms of who's right who's wrong on the change of the location of a couple flags does the board want to um, side with the applicant in terms of okay we don't want to argue about this let's stick with the original boundary does the board want to stand behind art and say no we've hired art we want to stick with the boundary that he's delineated um, so that's kind of one one main issue but from from my profession in my professional opinion as far as the the lots go um i think that some of the requests for variance to allow some of the houses are reasonable in the sense of that they were originally planned for and those lots were originally approved as house lots by the commission that order of condition has been continued and continued so I don't think that there's any harm in considering variances for the, the houses, but I do think it's important that the boundaries of the resource areas are accurately delineated and accurately um, documented on the plans, so. Okay, so thank you, Erin. Uh, I also just wanna bring up a point of order. Um, just so folks know, Leroy has not been on um, the commission long enough. It's been on for a while, but not long enough for this one. Um, so he needs to recuse himself tonight. So there are only four of us on the commission who are here tonight who are able to vote on this one. Um, the ruling that we got from general counsel a little while ago is what we need to pass a motion is a majority of the commission. So not a majority of the quorum, but a majority of the commission. So that means that all four of us would need to vote in favor of, um, of a motion to move it forward. If one of us opts not to, then the motion would not pass. So not to put undue pressure on anybody, but just kind of let everybody know um, that's the situation that we are facing. And so, Aaron, I was hoping that you might be able to start us off just with a little bit of visuals. And so can you pull up the plan and specifically um, show us where the flags are, where they're moved, where they were originally, where they were moved to? Ideally, we'd be able to deal with these flags first, and then we can move on everything else. If we do run into a stumbling block with these flags, then I'd suggest that we break apart um, the different lots and deal with them separately. Yeah. So I don't, um, I don't have any figure that shows the, the flags from Art Allen on the overall. Um, I haven't, nothing has been provided to me. I think that it's, that was sort of the last order at the last meeting was to map the locations of the flags and get them onto a figure so that we could see them. I know, um, I'm drawing a blank on her name. Um, I think it's Kristen, the representative from SWCA, had shared a figure um, with the board, which was just like a very rough figure showing um, some locations, but nothing has been shared with me as far as a change in the, um, the location of the flagging. Just the, all I have is basically the report from Art Allen and the photos from the field visit and then the information from Ted. Okay, so how about we just put up the plan as is, as was most recently submitted, we can at least highlight on there where the flags are that are being debated. Yep. Just to make sure that we're all sort of reoriented, reoriented with everything. Sorry, this is a little tricky to uh, get situated here for everybody. Stick with that. Okay. 
And just to remind folks, um, if there are for people who are here from the general public who are interested in making comments on this, um, we're going to go through a little bit of back and forth with the commission, and then we will most certainly open it up to general comments as well. So I'm just going to open up um, the final report from Art Allen just so that we can get an idea of the flags that were moved. Okay, so A26, A27, and A28. And two of those were moved fairly substantially, 20-ish feet. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you can read those flags numbers. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, well. Wait, so I, I can read it. So if you, I see A30, whoa. Sorry. And then there's A29. No. You can't see where I'm pointing. I don't know why I thought that would be helpful. <laughs> no, you can, you should be able to annotate, Anna, I think. Oh, if I go in the document, yeah. If you oh. go up to the top, there should be an option to annotate on the yep. screen. All right, so. This is A30 right there. Um, what do you, which one are you looking for? 2728. So scroll up, it's up. Yeah, but is that oh, on the, is that on? A27 is right here. Whoop. Ah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I see what you're, do you see what I'm saying? Eight, yeah. Those are on yeah. the wrong, those numbers that Art gave are wrong. They're, the actual flags that he moved are in lot eight. Yeah, that's what that was my understanding as well. That's why I was confused. This is a yeah, 67. A66 right here. So he was going off flags, flags that were hung in the field. Um, but maybe the flags in the field don't match up with what's on the plan. I'm not sure what's going on there. But yeah, the, the, I know that the flagging issue was, and it would have been really helpful to have them on the plan, but um, that it was like right around where it was really jagged, this boundary got really jagged. Because in his pictures, he's got, oh, hmm. oh I see. A59, yeah. Okay, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's across. Okay, yeah. So there's one. There was an issue. I'll just, it's going to be hard for me to toggle on this, but um, right about here. And then, let's see. Thank you, Anna, for. The other one was eight, yeah, 828 and 28R. Mm -hmm. Okay, so obviously there's a little bit of confusion at this point with flag numbers. Um, so that needs to get resolved. Um, I mean, so the underlying issue though that we're having is that there are two different, potentially two different definitions that are being applied. Um, and so as Aaron was saying, we did call in a third party reviewer um, and we have his report in front of us. And then Ted is disputing what those definitions are. Um, we got a copy of those definitions. Obviously we have them in general, but, um, they're also just sort of forwarded and highlighted to us as well. I mean, so commissioners, I mean, do you have any thoughts on the differences here? Which differences are you talking about? The, uh... Differences the flagging. Definitions. So, I mean, so basically, do we want to go with 
I mean, the big question is, do we want to go with arts flags? Um, do we, you know, throw those out and go with um, the original flagging or some combination thereof? I'm inclined to go with arts flagging. Would it be useful for me to explain what the substance of our difference with arts opinion is? Sure. Yeah, you can do that. And yeah, we did see the various back and forths, and we do have your report as well. But yeah, uh, I, I I think that you know the, the the words that are written in the Amherst Wetlands Regulations and the words that are written in C three ten CMR mean something. They're not to be interpreted in some way beneficial to one side or the other. I think that they mean something, and so the. The section that Art actually references in his report, um, 310 CMR 1057-2A6, it actually begins by calling, by defining the boundary of vernal pool habitat. Not a vernal pool, a vernal pool habitat. And in, in the definition section of 310 CMR, they don't define a vernal pool, they define a vernal pool habitat, and it says it's very specific as the area around the vernal pool up to 100 feet around the vernal pool. I believe that what Art has flagged is upland vernal habitat from the vernal pool. The Amherst Wetlands regulations define a vernal pool very specifically as an isolated depression that holds high water for, uh, you know, a minimum of two continuous months in the spring in most years. I don't think there's any, nobody is, the, the presence of water stained leaves does not suggest, does not prove that this area that art has flagged, this additional area that art has flagged contains water for two months. I mean, we're discussing establishing a buffer zone around the vernal pool not around the vernal pool habitat. So I think that a careful reading and comparison of, of the Amherst Wetlands Bylaw to 310 CMR is necessary in order to really make an informed decision on whether the additional areas that ARC has flagged are in fact part of the vernal pool proper or the vernal pool habitat. Okay, thank you, Ted. Um, yeah, I mean, so my reading on what uh, was submitted to us from Art is that he, you know, he thinks that that evidence that he saw does provide evidence that this is a vernal pool. Um, As he, but he, but he, quotes the Amherst Wetlands Bylaw, right? <laughs> so it's, 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 it's a little ambiguous. Sorry, I was looking these, for the... These indicators point to the presence of ponding water earlier in the spring season. For two continuous months. No, 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 I'm reading from Art's right. um, letter. Uh, and no one... Uh, you know, my interpretation of what art is saying. So yeah, there's interpretation on all sorts of sides here. Um, but my interpretation of what art is saying is that he does believe that that is evidence of a vernal pool, which is what we were asking him to do. I, 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 would, I respectfully disagree because he, he says that it's proof of ponding, but the definition of a of your definition of a vernal pool in the regulations is that it has to be for two continuous months in most years. Mm -hmm. And, and he, there is no evidence of that. He presents no evidence that. He just presents evidence of ponding. Fine, Nobody, this, nobody's disagreeing that he's presenting evidence of ponding. What we're, dis, what we're discussing is whether it's, whether what he has presented conforms to the letter of the Amherst Wetlands Regulations as it defines the vernal pool. So Aaron, I have a question here um, for you. I mean, I think it's one of the things that's tough is because this hearing has been going on for so long, we probably could have been watching this to see if it was full for two months or not, um, you know, many times. But I, I think I'm curious about what, 
is that something that's determined by continued monitor monitoring through spring and summer? How is that typically determined? Yeah, well, so, and, and I would definitely defer to Jen on, on some of the hydrology issues, but last year we had significantly lower than usual rainfall. So even if we had done a, a peer review last year, it wouldn't have been a great year to really get a, an accurate idea of where the water was generally. Um, this year was also pretty dry uh, in the early spring, and then we had a couple of good rainstorms. Um, but I mean, I know, I know the area where Art is talking about because I remember one of the first times I went out to walk there, I re remember seeing sphagnum moss beds in that area and wondering why those weren't included in the, but at the time we didn't have the vernal pool report. So it wasn't like we were going back and forth on the location of it. And I believe that's one of the areas that, that Art flagged out um, in that area. I think <laughs> it's really, it's, it's really tricky. And, and I, I hear where Ted is coming from, but I do personally think that ponding and holding water are essentially one in the same when we're talking about a vernal pool. If the characteristics of surface water being there wouldn't be there if there wasn't ponding there on a you know any frequent basis. So um, what we're getting hung up on is this two months measure, right? And so I think my question is how is that is that normally done through monitoring reports? Jen, I'm, yeah, I'm looking to you. Yeah. So I think, yeah, I think Aaron, you're uh, yeah, I think Anna, you're focusing on the right thing. And Aaron, I think another way to say what you're saying is when we delineate a vernal pool staining on the leaves is a sign of ponding and ponding is considered to be for the two months a year necessary for that to be a seasonal, a, a vernal pool slash seasonal wetland. So yeah. it's not like we usually distinguish between are these leaves stained because they've been ponded for two months versus are le these leaves stained because they haven't been. That's not a distinction. Like stained leaves are a delineator for a vernal pool habitat. Is that um, stated? And vernal pool, excuse me. Yeah. So is the is that indicator um, stated anywhere specifically in either the um, mass law or, or our bylaw that I because I'm not yes. where I'm just making sure I'm looking through it the right be in the mass Let law. Me, it's in the mass law, right? Okay. Yeah, staining is definitely in there, and a couple of the other indicators that Art mentioned is. Yeah, yeah. I did read these thoroughly through, but now I'm using my search function. Yeah, it's. I, <laughs> I've read through these so many times and I think part of the problem is so, and, and we've talked about this before too. So there, there is a, this is what's confusing about our local bylaw is that there is a, there's a definition for how to delineate seasonal wetlands and, right. and it, it goes through how to do that. And for seasonal wetlands, it can be stained leaves. It can be hydrology. It can be hydrophytic wetland vegetation, you know, over 50% dominant, those things yeah. can all be used to define or delineate a seasonal wetland. And then the subsection of that, which is vernal pools, the first line is vernal pools are seasonal wetlands. So yeah. um, any of those could be used. And from where I sit, the commission could call the entire BVW vernal pool because technically that's how it reads in our bylaw. However, I've talked to Art at, at length about this, and I've also read this bylaw a hundred times to try to like take a really reasonable view of it and also something that would be legally defensible. And to me, saying, you know, the the delineated edge of where we have observed conditions of ponding and, and using that as the extent to draw the hundred foot buffer is very reasonable. Um, rather than using the edge of BVW. I agree that I don't think that's productive and I don't think it would stand up in court. So I think, I think, you know, based on going over this a hundred times that that that's kind of my opinion on it. Yeah. yeah. There's a number of places in our Whoa, sorry, that, sorry, sorry, sorry. That get a little funky. And that's one of the reasons that they have been rewritten. Um, not that they have been put into place yet, but that's something I'm sure somewhere in Aaron's 
very full plate. So, okay. Um, yeah, so I am in favor of, as Larry was saying, of, you know, going with what um, arts flagging is. And so, um, so I hear, unless Larry has changed, I hear two of us who are in favor of art. Um, Anna or Jen, do you have feelings one way or the other? Yeah, I think art's the expert and he was out set out to delineate the vernal pool. And I think that's what he did. I think we should go with his flags. Okay. I agree. Okay. So Ted, uh, I think you can hear where we're going with this one. Um, and I realize that you disagree with that, but you know, that happens. Um, I think it's actually it runs contrary to your bylaw and I'm willing to, um, it, it, you know, there's a lot at stake here for Tofino and they've told me that they're willing to, uh, to uh, you know, take that dispute further if necessary, because sure. um, the, you know, your, the bylaw is written very specifically, the bylaw means something, the words mean something, and it's not uh, at the discretion of the Conservation Commission to selectively choose to ignore a provision of the bylaw because it uh, suits an agenda that they have to expand a resource area. So I think that um, that's, that's all I can say. <laughs> okay. And I'm also going to say that that was, uh, I don't know if inappropriate is the right thing to say. Uh, you're entitled, entitled to your opinion on what it is. Um, we are obliged by a oath that we all took to abide by the laws as well as we are capable of doing. Uh, obviously, you are more than welcome to bring this to appeals, and there definitely is another, um, you know, another set of, you know, another level that happens after this, but um, just want to say that that is not appreciated. So, okay, Jen, you were going to say something? I was just going to ask for clarification for the record. Can you just specify exactly which part of the bylaw you think that we are ignoring? I don't think you have demonstrated, nor has Art demonstrated, that this area that he has delineated holds water for a minimum of two months in most years. Okay. I, I think he's shown that it holds water. Sure, it, it can mm -hmm. hold water for weeks and a number of years in a row, and or for a portion of the spring, and those leaves would be stained. There's no doubt about that. And I, but I don't think that there's been any, any showing, a clear showing that it conforms strictly to the Amherst wetlands regulations, which say very clearly, there's seasonal wetlands that temporarily for a minimum of two continuous spring months in most years can find water. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think that you have demonstrated that, nor do I think Art has demonstrated that. And it's very easy to slough that off, but I, I, it, I don't think it's that quite that easy. Yeah, so, okay, so, so first just, it's not our job to demonstrate it. It's our job to evaluate the information we have and to protect the resource. So there's that just subtle fair, note. Fair enough. Also, so so one, one possible route forward might be some further clarification from art of other wetland indicators to fortify his delineation of the wetland. So that would be, that would be some great. other um, indicator, something like that. So there is a potential middle ground here where we can both, we can come to agreement on this, you know, should that be necessary. I just want to make I, that. I, I, that I think that's a reasonable, that's a reasonable position. Yeah. But um, we have two, sure we have two weapons professionals. Closure. I mean, we've been, I'm not sure what else we can do. We have a third party review. Um, he has been out there. He has done his thing. Conditions are worse now than they were before. I appreciate what you're saying, Jen. I don't mm -hmm. know if it's going to really move us forward, though. I think that just might delay things. Yeah. Right. So, can I ask a question? Is a third party review always definitive? No, it is up to our discretion. Um, and so, we have taken it under discretion. So, so well, yeah, we hire experts, you know, to provide opinions and then 
it's our job to try to interpret that. So from from my perspective, whether we dispute the accuracy of three flags or not is is not really, I mean, number one, we need to see where they're located, where the where the relocated flags are. And I think that was the first question that we brought up at the last hearing was, and I think when Christian was on the call and um, to, to get them on a plan so we can actually see where they are because when they're not on a plan, you know, it's just confusion. Where are they? We don't know. The, the, the flags that we're looking at here, the flag numbers are actually the BVW flag numbers. So that's what are called out on the plan. The vernal pool flags are not called out on the plan. So those, those numbers aren't there. So we can't even see where the relocated flags were at all, even to try to guesstimate where they're located. So that's number one. And number two, this is, this is just my personal opinion. The board is a completely autonomous decision-making body here, but let's just say for the sake of argument that those flags were relocated, picked up by survey, and that the boundary, boundaries were redrawn from those flags. I don't think anybody here is to say they wouldn't consider a request for a variance at that point in time once the boundary is redrawn. I think we all recognize, or at least I do as staff, that this project was approved back in 2004. And all we're trying to do is just define where the resource area boundary is, not necessarily to say, hey, you cannot go beyond this point and we're going to you know, hold you to that letter. It's more so we need to accurately show where the flags are so that we can move forward <laughs> and consider the variance. And so I don't wanna get into a dispute about the definition in the bylaw. I think we're being reasonable with the definition in saying, we're just looking at where we think the extent of ponding is and we're gonna draw the 100 foot from hundred foot from that boundary. Based on our bylaw, we could draw it from the edge of the, you know, hydrophytic vegetation or from hydric soils if we wanted to, but we're not going there because <laughs> we're trying to be reasonable about this. So I'm just trying to throw that out there is like, let's, I think we want to meet in the middle. We want to see these projects go forward and we don't want to get caught into like this nasty back and forth litigation issue we just want to accurately define the resource areas and, and see what's going on on the site. Okay, and I do see that at least one person from the public has their hand raised. And so I definitely will, we'll get to you in just a sec, so. Yeah, um, only thing I want to add to that, Aaron, is yeah, I mean, so this is a two-step process. We definitely need to get to the borders correct. I uh, agree with that 100%. How we move after that, that's going to be a separate discussion. Um, exactly. And so, but that is to be determined. Uh, and, you know, I think we have a strong track, track, strong track record of working with applicants to get stuff done where it's feasible. But if things are not feasible, there's, you know, there's nothing we can do there either. Okay, so um, I'm gonna go to the public. So, oh, uh, Aaron, can you allow Blake to speak? Of course. Can you can hear me now? Yep. yep, we can hear you now. Great. Um, I just wanted to make a, a few points is we decided in the fall that we're gonna have an expert to come because there was the discussion, what should the boundaries be? And, um, and I'm in an agreement that we should use what the expert is. I guess you could keep hiring different experts, but everyone agreed on art. So it seems like that should be the boundary we accept. And then I, I'm not sure in terms of how much we, you should, and this is clearly you're up to you, but first you shouldn't be intimidated by Tofino and uh, Ted Parker. They are suing all of us in the neighborhood. Uh, they do that as a technique. Uh, they, he's, trying to, he's trying to pressure you. Um, the other was we told them when we moved in, we were, came in here, uh, boy, 15 years ago, and we told them there was a vernal pool here. Doug Cole told me uh, that they pay high end lawyers to look at these things. We told Ted Parker later on about it and he said to stay off our property. We wrote him an email and replied. They, they're not trying to protect any of the vernal pool. 
They're just trying to protect their assets. And I think your, your job there as a governing body is to protect the, the wetlands and, I, and not to try to bend over backwards because they're, you're being intimidated by uh, Ted Parker and Tofino. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Blake. Um, so Aaron, can you give me permission to kind of manipulate what people can do or either that if you can just- Oh yeah, I'm sorry, let me see. Oh. Or you can, yeah, if you can lower Blake's hand and remove his ability to, to speak, thank you. Okay, I got it now, thank you. Just a little more control. Of course. Okay, um, so if there's anybody else or if Blake has something else to add, um, yeah, feel free to raise your hand. That's just not working. Okay, there we go. Okay, so um, back to the commission. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, Jen raised the idea that there, you know, uh, possibility is getting additional information, be that from art or other sources. Um, I think we have a lot of information um, personally, and this has been going on for quite some time. So, um, so how do people feel? I mean, are we comfortable moving forward with the information that we have, or is there more information that we want to seek before we move forward? Personally, I'm okay to move forward. So am I. I don't know. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, I think I'd like to, I'm combing through again. I did read the sections in preparation for this meeting, but I'm just combing through again, just to make sure I'm really clear on the parts of the bylaws being referenced here. Um, so I think Aaron, would I, this is now kind of mostly for my own edification. I'd love to see the parts that you're talking about where the reference is made. Um, but I'm also, um, I'm in agreement around arts, um, sticking with arts assessment and, and moving forward as you all have discussed. And so Jen, um, do you have a, a feeling on if you want more info and ho hopefully in a minute, Anna, um, Erin will be able to pull that up, but just while she's pulling that up, if Jen wants. I appreciate to. it. Uh, yeah, sorry. I No, I don't think we need more information. I still think we should stick with arts flags. I just wanted to point that out that you know, okay. there is a middle ground route. Yep, and Leroy, um, obviously you're not allowed to vote, but um, you know, you've been in a lot of these meetings about this. Um, so, I mean, if you have an opinion or something, it would it'd be beautiful to hear. Uh, I, we should definitely stick with arts flags and there's not much wiggle room there for me. Uh, it was all agreed to ahead of time. Anything else is just more delay, especially with you leaving in a month. The quicker we can wrap some of these up, the better. Great, thank you, Leroy. And it looks like Aaron found the, the piece that you're looking for, Anna. Thank you. Great, thanks, Aaron. I would say, I just Aaron starts though that uh, you can interpret our bylaws very broadly to incorporate a lot of things. And I think we are taking a very reasonable look at this and trying to meet in the middle. I think it's an honest attempt by most sides so far. Mm -hmm. I haven't been here since the beginning of it. But. So Aaron, you said that was page 29, right? Is that what I saw? Yep, 29, okay. Thank you. Yep, staying, staying with where I'm, where I was before. Okay. Um, so I think it's fairly clear that we're going to go with arts flags. Um, we have a little bit of an impasse at this point because those flags are not on any of the materials that we have in front of us. Um, and so, and there's even a little bit of confusion, at least from what I could see, which specific flags we're talking about. And so are we able to move forward on any of the lots at this point, Aaron? Oh, you're on mute. Oh, Aaron, you're still on mute. I don't, I don't have any documentation showing where the flags, the former flags were located and where the new flags were located. And I think that's what we had requested at the last meeting was to get 
arts flags on paper so we could see where those changes are located and then see how they impact the lots and the notice of in, notices of intent that are before us. And to me, those are pieces of information that we need in order to render a decision on the project. Um, so I guess what it comes down to is whether the applicant is willing to put those flags on the plan so that we can render a decision. And if they're not, then it would be a denial for lack of information. Uh, of course, we're willing to put them on. Okay. So if we could just see where they are and see you know, how that changes things, I think from there, the board would be more equipped to render a decision. Okay. And so just to reiterate, um, so without that information, we can't even really figure out which lots are not being impacted. Because I mean, I would love to at least Correct. get some of these off the books tonight, but I'm just having a really hard time figuring out which lots are not going to be impacted at all. Right. And I mean, I, I think we have a general sense of that, but without seeing them on the plan and without seeing the redrawn 100 foot, it's impossible to be certain because we don't have, if we had the vernal pool flags, I think we maybe could have somewhat of an idea, but we don't, we don't even have the vernal pool flags shown on the plan to be able to assess where art relocated the flagging. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So unfortunately, yeah, it sounds like we're going to need a continuation again. Um, and I know we're all frustrated with that. So um, yeah. So what we're looking for, Ted, I think hopefully that's clear is the revised flags to be placed on the map. Um, if you want to show both sets of boundaries, two separate maps, either are fine. Uh, an overlay would actually be good as well. Um, so that we can see where the revised ones are and, you know, then we can move forward from that point. I'll get Berkshire design on it tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. So one question for Aaron and the commission though, is when do we continue this too? <laughs> so the 14th is our next one. That's already jam packed. That being said, this one has been going a long time and we got to get through it. So I, I wouldn't recommend putting it on for the 14th because, you know, we've got, um, you know, six lots here to consider and um, with six other new open hearings, I just think that it's, it's going to not work out to get through it. I would recommend that we put it on for July 28th with the expectation that at that meeting, a decision on all of the lots is going to be rendered. I mean, so I appreciate what you're saying, Aaron. Um, we can do it on, I just want to put it out there. We can do it on the 14th. Um, it would be a long meeting. Um, in the past, we've had meetings that have gone past 11, which isn't a lot of fun. And we want to avoid that where possible. That being said, there are no mandates for the meetings to only last a certain amount of time. I think we have um, uh, not quite a requirement, but you know, we have an obligation to move things through as quickly as we can. Um, so. I mean, I don't know how others feel about it, but I think with the current agenda that we have set for the 14th that we're looking at dealing with this after nine o'clock. Um, and I just think that with fresh eyes and allowing this enough ample time when, you know, commissioners are able to really dedicate their attention to it, that um, that would be the way to go. But it's really up to you guys. Um, you know, I get paid to sit here, so you guys are the volunteers. <laughs> Yeah, my fear is that if we don't close this on the 28th, um, this will, we'll have to have a new hearing. So because at that point, I will be off and I don't think that we'd have enough people on um, to necessarily continue it at that point. And that so, would be my fear too. <laughs> Leroy, <laughs> is that your, your fear? Because then you'd be a voting, you'd have to vote on it. 
Okay, <laughs> Unless it reopened. So just to reiterate what you're saying, Aaron, is that if we moved it to the 14th, we'd not, we'd, it'd be late in the evening and we have a really packed agenda. But if we move it to the 28th, it's got to get totally solved or we're up a creek. Confirming yeah. that. Correct. Well, and I'm not even sure that, I'm not even sure that's, okay, so taking a step back. Right, we have a six, we have a seven member board. Okay. Um, right now we have two members who can't vote Laura who's in a butter and we have Leroy who's new who hasn't been present for all of the meetings that leaves five of us right. One of those members, I don't know when your appointment is actually up Brett so and I don't know if that's being continued. If your appointments being continued. I don't know for certain of that and the reason for that is because. Um we already have one person who's been identified who's going to be appointed to the board and i think larry's term isn't actually expiring i think he's able to be reappointed but i haven't been able to determine that for certain so it could be if if brett's term expires at the end of june june 30th which i don't know if it goes by fiscal year if brett will be here at the next meeting i don't know that for certain um so whether we do it on the 14th or the 28th, I'm not sure makes a huge difference other than the standpoint of it'll be earlier in the night and members will be fresher to look at it. But I do agree that sooner is better. And, you know, it's like all it takes is one voting member not being here like Fletcher tonight. He had a work obligation, couldn't be here. So he'll have to review the proceedings. But all it will take is one other member not being here and then we won't have a quorum. So and we don't hold special meetings, do we? Like we don't hold additional meetings. As, okay, just checking. We never have. I'm not sure. There'd be a lot of paperwork involved in making sure we have our notifications in time. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, the other thing about the 14th, I mean, we do have a lot of on our on our agenda. It's not uncommon for you know new hearings to be continued, but we don't know that. So that's a complete crapshoot. So. But it does seem to be our track record. So it I personally like, am in favor of the 14th. But. Yeah, it seems like we might just need to like tough it out and do a long meeting, which is not ideal, but that seems safer to me than doing, than pushing it all the way to the 20, whatever the other day was. 28th. 28th, thank you. So how about Jen or Larry? What are your thoughts? Because we all would really need, I mean, Jen and Larry would need to commit to be able to being there at least with Fletcher being an unknown right now. Um, my, my concern on it right now is that I may have a, I may end up having a problem with the 14th. That's, that's, <laughs> that, that's, um, I, and I'm not sure about it yet. I've got a family thing that is, it was going on. So I'm not sure about that one yet. Um, that's my only concern in, in terms of that is that it might drop your numbers. So yeah, we need four. And yeah, as Anna was saying, Fletcher is the other unknown. So Ted, yeah, how I'm, soon? Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to weigh in that I think either is, I don't have a strong opinion. How soon you do you think re revisions would be turned around from? I, I, I won't know until I talk to Berkshire and see what their load is. Um, but I mean, I, you know, I, I would suggest that it get one option might be to uh, continue it to the 14th. And if either you lack a quorum or the meeting is going too long, it could be continued again to the next date. But if, like someone suggested, there are other folks who continue or don't aren't ready to present on the 14th and we might be able to get the whole thing done on the 14th or at least or at least most of them because there's six of them yeah, i think once we get through one hopefully the rest of them will fly <laughs> I, I, I i i agree with that <laughs> so uh, um in that case july 14th we have a slot at 7 55 and and again i'm only allowing five minute blocks for each hearing yep. So that, that is a very artificial timeline just in case we have a continuation so that we can keep moving. So Understood. 
So that being said, so July 14, we could start as early as 7.55 though. Right. Yeah, so if we're sticking around late, you're sticking around too, Ted. Sorry. Yeah, I got it. No worries, no worries. I've been here the whole time. Okay. Thank you, everyone. So looking for a motion so for continuation to the 14th at 7.55. I move we continue the hearings for Tofino and Associates to July four, June July 14th at 7.45. Second. Thank you. Okay, so voice vote. Larry. Aye. Anna. Aye. Jen. Aye. Uh, Leroy. You have to recuse. Yeah, recuse. Yep, and I for me as well. So, okay, Ted, so um, look forward to seeing the new documents and seeing you on the 14th. Thank you all, good night. Okay, so I'm trying to figure out where we are at this point. Um, okay, so the next one that is on our agenda was the railroad one and is that one being continued? Yeah, so let me give you a little update on that. So um, they are refusing to do a peer review. They're basically saying we're, we're not gonna pay for a peer review um, to review the boundary line. I did, um, respond back and I asked, um, and I, I can pull up the correspondence, but I responded back and I said, you know, this is the same plan that was submitted, um, I think it was six years ago for the previous RDA. And it doesn't appear that any due diligence has been done in the last six years to check the line. And the response was basically that when they're out there spraying, if they see a change that they'll adjust it at that point. And I'm like, well, I don't really think that that's, uh, reasonable. I don't foresee that the people who are out doing the application are going to say, oh, wait, hold on a second. There's a, there's a beaver impoundment over here. We should stop spraying now, even though this is a spray area on the plan. Um, so I would just, my recommendation on this one, quite frankly, is that we, um, and actually, I wonder if the, could, could you check and see if, um, if Keith Morris is on the call. Uh, we have a Jim and a Tony. Okay. And if Keith, if you are on the call, Keith Morris, who's the, the applicant's representative, he was supposed to be on tonight. He hasn't showed up for a single um, public meeting, discussion, presentation, anything on this. Um, and the railroad is refusing to do a peer review to check the boundaries for accuracy. That plan that was submitted to us is the same plan that was submitted with the RDA six years ago. And based on those factors, I would recommend um, a positive determination checking box two, which is not confirming the boundaries, the resource area boundaries for the project. And this is a utility. I mean, is this considered utility railroads? I mean, They're so like transportation. You know, yes, I mean, there's certain, um, things that they're allowed to do. I mean, so they have to sort of ask permission, but we're not allowed to, de to, to deny per se. So if we deny this, can they not move forward or do you know what happens on their side? Um, well, they would have to come back with a plan to us that has been reviewed in some form or fashion. He, he, there, I asked their representative if in advance of this filing, if any due diligence had been done along the, the line whatsoever. And I was told no. Mm -hmm. And I was told that, I mean, it's in this email, I was told that he, he has not been out to, um, to check the line. Um, and he, there's other correspondence in the folder, which I can open up and we can take a look at. But he said that um, they're addressed, they, they address, address changes in the spraying annually. Um, and that if they're out there doing the spraying and they see uh, some change like a beaver impoundment or something else that they would then adjust the spraying at that time. And 
I've never run into this before, to be honest with you, where uh, a, pl a plan has been so, um, I'm not saying it's accurate or inaccurate, it's just it's, it hasn't been checked since the last ap application at all. Well, lo looking at the things they said, it sounds like they do this all over the state. They do. That nobody tends to bother them about what they want to do. Aaron, did you get any feedback from the state on this one? Um, from DEP? Yeah. No, but what I know is that um, that we are completely within our right to ask for a peer review of the boundaries. Yep, I think we are as well. It's just kind of nice sometimes if we get that confirmation from the state, just one more piece of paper or one more yeah, mm -hmm. stick to add to the pile. So, but that's fine. I mean, and if you guys are comfortable with what they've submitted, that's completely fine. I, I, I mean, <laughs> I don't think anybody's I've been a, I, I think I've been a we, can, <laughs> we can let that one go, Aaron. I don't think anybody's comfortable with what they did. So okay. the question is I, if you're how to move forward. I'm, I'm just not sure. I mean, to me, it looks like somebody took a, a USGS topo with a Sharpie and just drew, drew a line spray, no spray, as opposed to like really looking at it to determine where the resource areas are. I know in the, when I did a desktop review, just to compare apples to apples on what they had submitted, um, there was at least one intermittent stream or a stream that went under the railroad tracks that was not accounted for in the spray or no spray zones. Okay, so uh, I think that we basically have two. So what would be the reason for continuing? I mean, so they're not gonna provide any more additional information unless they said that they were gonna, and he, he this person said that they were gonna be here. They're gonna try and be here tonight, so. But well, obviously they didn't show. Yeah, I don't think that they show up for any hearings for before any commission. I think they just submit the plan and ex expect sort of a rubber stamp on it. Okay. He has he hasn't attended a single hearing. So I think we can definitely give him a stamp tonight. Uh, may not be the stamp he'd want, but yeah. And you guys are more than welcome to continue if you want, but I just don't see, I mean, unless you're, it's either gonna be an approval of the boundary or a denial of the boundary. If we don't have, there's no other, no other option. I mean- I mean, like there's any point in continuing. Like they said, I mean, they said no to a peer review, then like, what do we expect to change, to shift by continuing? Exactly. We can continue to the 14th and see if he shows up and see how long he'd have to stay. <laughs> Right. You are full of the full of the witties today. <laughs> we'll have a slumber party. <laughs> to leave in joke. So. Um, so okay. Sorry guys, my internet keeps dropping off. We delegated you to go walk the railroad line. Um so can I make a motion? I, I mean everywhere. <laughs> are we at a point where a motion is helpful or is it at is there something different that folks want to keep talking about this? I just want to make sure that there's no more discussion than anybody okay. wants to have. So Jen or Larry or Leroy, I mean, I'm leaning towards um, positive determination, but. Okay. So not hearing anything else. Yeah, looking for a motion uh, for a negative, or I'm sorry, positive determination uh, on this one. I was muted and I said the perfect one. Uh, move we issue a positive determination of applicability, checking box 2B, not confirming the boundaries for the New England Central Railroad. That's it. Second. Okay, voice vote, Leroy. Aye. So Larry. Aye. Jen. Aye. Anna. Aye. And I from me as well. So um, if you can forward that on to them, Aaron, and then yeah, see where we go from there. Great, thank you. Okay, so are we moving on to the um, 622 University Drive now? Correct. Okay, so this is uh, a notice of intent. And so this is a new hearing. 
And so, um, oops, that's not the right document. Okay. Okay. Hmm. A little document disappeared, sorry. Just looking for my verbiage for officially opening and for some reason Word is not my friend right now. So I'm quitting Word and I am reopening Word. Hi, Tony. Hi, good evening. How is everybody? Good. I just figured we'd say hi while Brett was getting his document up. Good. Um, Aaron, maybe you can, um, I don't know if you want to bring Jim on. That's my client. He's a representative from Greenfield Savings Bank, I believe. Yes, I will. We just have to wait for Brett to yes, do the opening for the hearing. Oh, but, okay. um, I didn't have said hi. I was getting it for myself. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, my computer, I can see the damn one on my. I have no idea where it is. Aaron, would you be able to resend me that document real quick? I don't know what's, or just paste it into a, um, into an email. Oh, wait, nope, I see it now. Oh, I found it. It was hiding. Okay, phew, here we go. Sorry about that. Whirlwind of emotions. This public hearing is now called to order. This hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth, an act relative to the protections of wetlands, as most recently amended in Chapter 3.3 and Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaw. Um, this is, I had to close my other window. Um, this is in relation to. Uh, property down at University Drive and Q. Remind me of that number, Aaron. I just lost. Yeah, it. let me. Um, oops. Um, oh, well, I just. Or I'll. Okay. Um, this one is being presented by SVE Associates on behalf of Greenfield Savings Bank for proposed AP, ATM machine and associated site work in the existing parking lot at 622, 622 University Drive, uh, Map <coughs> Parcel 20. So welcome, Tony. And so after that long sort of fumble on my part, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and giving us a bit of background on the project. Um, sure. My name is Tony Wonseski. I'm an engineer with SVE Associates, and um, we're representing Greenfield Savings Bank. Um, the, the property um, that we're going to be looking at is the New Market Center. It's at the intersection of University and Am Amity. And, um, um, the shopping center has been there for quite some time. And I think back in 2002, um, Jim can correct me if I'm wrong, um, they ended up leasing a portion of the Northerly building to um, have a branch office in Amherst there at that location. Uh, what they're trying to do now is to install uh, an ATM and um, what we would be doing is um, we looked at a, a few alternatives of where to locate the ATM and um, uh, we chose the corner, which would be the, the, the northwest corner of the parking lot. Um, there were, in my narrative, I, I described why we chose that. Um, we looked at other areas within the parking lot. We looked along the, the southerly part, there's seven parking places in that area that were created. We looked at that position. We ended up choosing this position here because it allows for cars to enter into the ATM. And also when they pull out, they give them very good sight distance down the aisle or um, the um, straight away to the aisle running north south along the westerly perimeter of the parking lot. Um, just the most safe area that um, we thought away from the main entrance where most of the traffic comes in and out along the frontage of the buildings. 
Um, but in doing so, in picking that location, um, we're within the 100 foot buffer zone to a wetland that is um, a drainage way. It's uh, between university and the parking lot. Uh, back um, earlier this uh, spring, we had Wendell Wetland Services go out and flag the wetlands and you'll see that delineation. And also there's a sketch within the, the application that we submitted. Their flagging is one through 20 along there. And you, um, we actually had a hard time finding it because when it was flagged, it was pretty open, but um, the, the vegetation has grown quite a bit. And um, the um, owners of the property, uh, Gleason, John Dro, um, they also own the, the landscape company that maintains this. So uh, it appears to me that they're pretty, um, uh, uh, have a pretty good idea or have been educated very well on where they're allowed to mow and not to mow because they, um, they're definitely away from um, the wetland boundary and, uh, and not altered any of that. Um, so when we do this construction, we are going to, there's 13 parking spaces um, along that northerly edge. And our goal was to keep the improvements for the most part within that perimeter curb. At the very corner, there's an existing new market sign. It's a circle and has new market center on it. That existing freestanding business sign will be removed and it won't be replaced. So, with that, um, we saved five of the parking spaces plus the one AD, AD accessible space there at the corner, but we will be removing eight parking spaces. And when we do that, we actually create more impervious area um, and, and to match what's out there, it's, it's um, on this corner, you have the wetland vegetation and the buffer area that's allowed to grow. In the remainder, you have some trees, large trees and, and, and lawn and just mainly lawn. So we will have some grading along the edge of that curb and obviously where we make that new island. So our goal is to go back and, and loam and seed that area to be similar to the area that's outside the existing curb right now. Um, drainage in this area drains to, um, uh, if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see there's an existing catch basin there with an outlet pipe to the swale. So we, um, we would not um, be changing any of that drainage. And we'd have, as, you know, with the, um, with the um, there's the catch basin down on the lower left. We'll, um, we won't be creating any point source discharges. Everything will be maintained as it is today, um, drainage wise. And with the, the, the minor change in, um, in, in pervious area, uh, creating additional pervious area, the, the probably not even calculable, but uh, uh, would would very closely match what's there, be slightly less than what that catch basin experiences today. We've shown on the plan um, a double barrier of silt fence and straw wattle along the back of the curb, and where we would do some tie-in grading to protect the um, the wetland area. Um, because the local regulation, you have some setbacks there. There's a 30 foot setback to a building and there's also a 70 set setback or 30 foot no disturb or, or disturb zone. And then a 70 foot setback for building, obviously um, none of, and parking lot, there's a 25, I believe setback. None of these um, um, would meet that. This would be essentially a grandfathered project because the parking lot, as you can see, is very close to the edge of the wetland in that area. We're not gonna be right there, but it's very close to the back of the curb. Um, so we would ask for relief on that to be able to put the, the, um, the, the, the um, ATM at this location. Um, the, as I mentioned before, um, Gleason Jondro, their own um, um, uh, landscape company maintains this um, because it's within the existing parking lot area, the disturbed area, we would anticipate that their snow removal and so forth would be the same as was before. Um, Jim was able to talk to um, the property owner and essentially, because I haven't seen it in the winter time, how they do manage the snow, but they mentioned that they pile it up in the islands within the, um, within the parking area and also um, 
actually in heavy snowstorms take up some of the parking spaces. So uh, they don't um, push the snow to the wetland area. Um, also, we asked a question about um, um, whether they used herbicides or pesticides at this site and their maintenance of the lawn and so forth and, and vegetation, and they do not. Um, and so they would be operating under a previously approved maintenance plan um, that was granted uh, that they submitted when they were um, their special permits were approved for this site. Um, I guess that's a brief overview um, of what we're doing. It's a fairly small project, but it would be um, add um, provide service, additional service to the um, for the bank customers, and also would, um, provide another service for just people needing to use an ATM in that area of town. So, um, you know, we're excited. I think they're excited to be there and provide provide this additional service and. Um, I think we'll try to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tony. Um, Jim, do you want to introduce yourself and do you have anything else you want to add before we go to Aaron? Uh, sure, hi. For, my name is Jim Loind and I'm with Greenfield Savings Bank. I'm the facilities and security officer. Um, one of the compelling reasons for this project is um, in addition to being a, a good community, uh, neighbor that Tony mentioned, uh, adding the service uh, to the area. Um, we're doing so with the intent to uh, provide uh, an additional option for um, our customer and community safety in that um, rather than have to do in-person banking, uh, they'll have the option uh, for safe social distancing uh, to do uh, banking from their vehicle without interacting with the public or uh, barriers. And I know everybody is optimistic that um, we're on our way out of um, the pandemic, but uh, I think there's still uh, some hurdles in that area and uh, would, would like to provide this option uh, for the community. Great, thank you, Jim. And so Aaron, I see you have something on the screen now. So if you wanna go over that, and then also if you have any photos, that'd be great. Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll share photos first, actually. Um, this is, these are a couple photos from the site right here of the, um, where the work area would be. And um, I did uh, communicate with Tony earlier today about just some general questions I had on the property and he actually addressed several of them already as far as the herbicide and pesticide use, the snow storage on the property. Um, one of the, um, I guess, questions that I had was in the, um, the grading area that's around the ATM, if there was any opportunity for, because it said landscaped areas. So that's where I was kind of going to with planting of native species or pollinator species in there. Um, and they're, they've sort of indicated that they'd like to keep it the way that it is. Um, from, from my standpoint, I think this is a pretty basic project. It's, it's an existing parking lot. Um, you know, they're not really changing very much. It's, it's pretty minuscule in terms of the amount of change from what it was there before and what's there, what they're proposing to do. Um, if there's any opportunity to add plantings, I think that would be wonderful, but it, it sounds like that's not something that they're proposing as part of the project. Um, and basically that's, that's it. I, it's pretty simple. I mean, I would recommend that the board do our standard boilerplate um, state and local conditions. And um, if there were any plantings, I'd recommend that they be native species and preference to pollinators. And then, um, I think it would be worthwhile to have a permanent demarcation of the wetland boundary, similar to what we do with other projects. Um, maybe some rebar would be appropriate here since it's within the vegetated buffer, but um, I'll leave that to the commission to decide. And uh, then I would just recommend the conditions of no snow storage in the wetland and um, no herbicides and pesticides on the property for landscaping. Sounds good, Aaron. And that, yep, that one about the herbicides and pesticides is the only other one I had on my list. So, okay. Um, so commissioners, thoughts on this one? 
I agree. This seems pretty basic and, yep. and Aaron recommended, um, mo uh, oh my God, the final brain cell. Everything Aaron recommended makes a lot of sense to me, especially around the, um, uh, or what Brett said about the snow as well. Um, but yeah, pretty basic, makes sense. I agree. Yep, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else, Tony, what that we talked about when we were out there. So, I don't um, think no, the only other question that came up was whether the some of the mature trees were going to be um, removed to make this happen. And that's not our intention. Those trees are going to stay. And essentially, we're just going to increase some more lawn that's already there. As you go farther to the east, you'll see that there's um, evergreen planters. There was some, um, I don't know if it's juniper or whatever, low growing evergreens in that area. Um, I think I, I, I think we're, our goal was just to keep for the visibility of the ATM, just keep it the lawn and extend it over to the areas that we're creating um, in per pervious area. Um, just keep that lawn area um, so that it can be maintained. Yeah, one thing that we're looking at, I was just remembering Tony in the field was the catch basement. And yeah, um, yeah it's yeah. kind of old and could definitely use some work, but that's out of scope of what we're talking about here. So, but once they do redo the parking lot, which should be fairly soon, it looks like, right. that would definitely be something to consider at that point. Right, I think that's the appropriate time to do that. So, so anybody have any other comments or questions about this one? Okay, if not, we're looking for a motion. I move we uh, issue the order of conditions, or sorry, I, I move that we approve the project on, what's the number? And issue the order of conditions on something, something University Drive. If this is the DEP number. Oh, thank uh, you. Uh, DEP number, oh my gosh, Aaron, you're killing, it's so far away. I did so well before. Zero, uh, 0687, did I get that? 0890687. Yes. Um, with a, uh with the boilerplate conditions under Aaron. i'm sorry it just opened it's delayed <laughs> okay uh under the mat <laughs> i'm not doing hot it's not doing so hot today i move we order the order of conditions with boilerplate conditions under the massachusetts wetlands protection act and town of amherst wetlands protection bylaw with the additional special conditions uh are we including that one native species oh. and no thank you of permanent demarcation of the wetland boundary uh, with either rebar wetland markers or boulders, no herbicide and pesticides with landscaping, and then no, no storage within the wetland area. Excellent. Second. Sorry, y'all. Okay, so looking for a voice vote. Larry. Aye. Anna. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Jen. Aye. And I for me as well. So thank you, Tony. Thank you, Jim. Uh, paperwork will be coming quickly from or be coming soon from Aaron. Great. Thank you all. We really appreciate your time. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye bye. OK, so moving on down. Um, so this is the um, GZA application on behalf of Lisa Kittredge. But I think, Aaron, you were saying that this is going to be um, continued. Yes, so we're just waiting on a contract from uh, procurement to um, to get art out there. And I've heard that it's going to be tomorrow. I'm hoping that we'll get art out there maybe by the end of the week. But tonight we won't be able to take any action, unfortunately. And we did actually, I talked with, um, with Adrian and they are comfortable being on for the 28th. So. Okay, excellent. And it will be at 730. That was just a last minute conversation. So I didn't get to up the, update this, but they're comfortable being on for the 28th. So that'll free up a little bit of time for us on the 14th. Sounds good. So any discussion? If not, I'm looking for a motion. Moving to continue the public hearing at 12 for 29, no way and two, 728, 730. Second. Thank you. So, Larry? Aye. Jen? Aye. Aye. Sorry. Leroy? Aye. Anna? Aye. 
and I for me as well. Okay, so that's the last sort of um, official thing that's on the agenda. Are there other pieces that we need to address tonight, Aaron? Nope, that's, the, that's all I have for you tonight. Okay, we're seven minutes early, so we can bank it for next time. Um, so Aaron, if you can get in touch with whoever needs to get in touch with about if I will be here on the 14th, that would be appreciated. Um, I think Larry- well, I'll send an email to Dave. Okay, I think Larry would probably appreciate knowing what his status is as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we will move forth from there. Okay, so with that, looking for a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn this meeting at 8.53 p.m. Second. Anna? Aye. Leroy? Aye. Larry? Aye. Jen? Aye. And I for me as well. So thank you, everyone, and have a great night. And I think our dogs are going to start barking each other. <laughs> <for you. laughs> have a good night, everybody. Bye. Good night, guys. Enjoy. Thank you.